7.30, how you feel today? Good, good, good. Good to be at church. Well, we are indeed continuing our series in parables. Now, if you've been with us uh, really just since last week, uh, we've been using these things called stereograms to help us illustrate what a parable is. Now, how many of you by now, you know what a stereogram is? Just show of hands, okay? Now, how many of you, you're like, nope, don't, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Show of hands, okay? Well, we have a picture for you. This is a stereogram, all right? It's got a lot of colors on it, a lot of shapes. It seems really weird. Now, we've been using these to illustrate what a parable is. Now, by definition, a parable is a profound revelation of truth. Now, stereograms, they're kind of like this, right? You you look at them, you stare at them, you got to kind of go cross-eyed a little bit just to be able to see something. But something profound happens when you look at them, when you, when you, when you find it. There's an image embedded in those stereograms. It's really cool. They're pretty stinking awesome. I remember going to, uh, when I was in elementary school, I would go to the library and uh, I really wasn't much of a reader. I was more picture-oriented, so I'd get, like, the picture books and things. But my life changed when I found a book full of these stereograms. You guys remember this? It was called the Magic Eye book. Show of hands. Yeah, you guys remember Magic Eye? So they're really neat. You'd open them up, and uh, the first stereograms are super easy, kind of built up your confidence. And then as you'd go further throughout the book, they got harder and harder. They were so cool. Loved them. And at the beginning of that book... There was this introduction, and it said this. It says, stare into these seemingly abstract fields of color. No funny glasses required. And an enchanting 3D image will materialize all from an abstract, seemingly random field of color. Once you discover your magic eye, a whole new world of experience will open up to you. You will be astounded by the depth and clarity of the totally hidden image that develops before you like an instant photo. The cool thing about these stereograms is that they're more than just they're more than just abstract shapes and colors thrown on a piece of paper. Some of you you went out to the gallery out in the lobby and that's kind of what you think it is. You haven't bought in. You're like all of you guys you're telling me a big lie. There's nothing to see. How many of you are that person? Right? Okay. See, they're, they're, they have a deeper meaning, though, don't they? These stereograms, they have, a, they have a deeper meaning. They reveal that there is something beyond the surface. There's meaning to them. But what you have to do, what I have to do is we have to find it. And that's the big idea of this series in parables, that there is meaning to this life. But you and I, we have to find it. Our job is to find it. And when you find the meaning, just like that Magic Eye book said, a whole new world of experience opens up to you. When you find the meaning of life, it's like life becomes vibrant. Life becomes real to you. And so because I love you, I want to give you the cheat code, okay? I want to give you the cheat code to the meaning of life. Now, how many of you church people, you know what it is? Because we're all looking for it. We're all looking for meaning and purpose. But what do you think the meaning of life is? Go ahead, shout it out. Jesus. Good job. 99% of church answers is Jesus. Good job. But it is. That is our mission as a church, really, is to help people find and, uh, find and follow Jesus. It's about him. It doesn't matter if you uh, have followed Jesus your whole life, if you're new to faith, or maybe you're away from God. The reality is the same for all of us. The meaning and the purpose that we're looking for, it's found in Jesus. And when you find Jesus, you find the meaning. And the longer you look at Jesus, the more clear your life and your purpose becomes. It's like a whole new world of experience opens to you. Colossians chapter 1, look at this. It says this about Jesus. It says, we look at this son and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this son and see God's original purpose and everything he created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels. Everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. So Jesus, for us, he is at the center of life. Jesus was at the very beginning, actually, of all creation. The Bible says that all things were created through him and for him. It's about Jesus, your meaning, your purpose, your worth, your value, your, your identity, man, it's found 
in him. And that's what Jesus is trying to do in these parables. As, he's, as, as we're going to look at these parables, we looked at one last week, and then we're going to continue to look at them. Jesus, what he's trying to accomplish is he's trying to show us what God is like. And he wants to help us and, and give us the path to find God. So today we're going to look at another parable found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20. So if you have your Bible, turn to it now, Matthew chapter 20. We're also going to put the verses up on the screen. But it's the parable of the workers. So what Jesus is going to do in this parable is he's going to bring up something that you and I deal with. Actually, that all of the world deals with at some point or another. And it's the subject of fairness. Everybody say fairness. Fairness. We all want... We all want what's fair in this life, right? I want to be treated fairly. You want to be treated fairly. We want what's fair. Take, for instance, Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth. We've got a picture of Chris. Whoa, easy. Hey. Chris Hemsworth. Like, for me, it's not fair that one guy gets to look like this. It's not fair that one guy gets all of these muscles, and I don't. It's not fair that one guy gets a dietitian and a nutritionist and a personal trainer to follow him everywhere that he goes 24 hours a day, and then there's me. You know what I mean? Like, it's not fair. My wife thinks I look like Thor, so, eh. You go, your wife is blind. <laughs> yeah. It's in us. It's human nature to want what's fair in this life. And it's been in us since the day that we were born. I have three boys. They're ages six, five, and three. And when I go to them and I'm like, hey, it's time to kind of clean up, pick up around the house. Okay, you take care of the downstairs. You take the upstairs area. And then you go to your room and clean up that area. If it's happened once, it happens a million times. One of them will always say, but dad, that's not fair. You know, parents, you know what I'm talking about? It's in us. It's this cry of, of injustice somehow. I want what's fair. And we look around today, we see in our culture, we see in our society, it still happens. Day in and day out, people want what's fair. The problem is, every one of us, we have a different definition of what's fair. What's fair to me may not be what's fair to you, and what's fair to you may not be what's fair to me. What Jesus will do in this parable is he's actually going to blow up our definition of what we think is fair. What we're going to see is that what we need ultimately, we desperately need God's definition of fair. And he's going to give us this better understanding of fairness. Because <clears throat> you'll see that you need and I need to understand that there is something far better than fair to live by. And that is grace. That is grace. So let's look at this together in Matthew's gospel beginning in verse 1. Jesus is talking here and he says this. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius. Now, a denarius was a full day's wage. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. Now about five in the afternoon, at the end of the day, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one's hired us, they answered. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came, and look at this, each received a denarius, a full day's wage. Man, so verse 10, when those who came who were hired first, who'd been working all day, they expected to receive more. They're like, this is going to be awesome. He paid him a full day's wage. We've been here all day. Man, we're going to the Sizzler tonight. It's going to be awesome. It's a steakhouse, the Sizzler. Okay. 
But each one of them, look what happens. Each one of them also received a denarius, a full day's wage. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you've made them equal to us who've borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. They're like, we've been out here sweating. We've been out here working. These guys come in. We still smell the deodorant on them like this isn't fair. But he answered one of them. I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. What I want to do today is I want to take a look at these two different groups of people, the first workers and the last workers. The first workers who made it about what they do, about their performance, and then I want us to look at the last workers who realized it wasn't about what they did. It wasn't about their performance. And I want us to see how you and I, we're better off when we live with the understanding and the mindset that there's something far better than fair to live by, and that's grace. So turn to your neighbor, say, grace is better than fair. Grace is better than fair. Grace is better than fair. All right, let's look at the first workers. The first workers, man, they were, they were, you can kind of sympathize with them a little bit. Like, that doesn't seem real cool. Like, they, they, they've been working all day. It doesn't seem fair. They, it's like, yeah, you get their anger. You get their frustration with the landowner. I mean, put yourself in their shoes for just a minute. Let's say your boss comes up to you, and he grabs another coworker, and he pulls you into their office, and he's like, hey, listen, I, we, I want you to present. I've got this big project that I want you to take, and I want you to present to me and the board your ideas on Friday. And it's Monday, and you're like, okay, we can do that. It's going to be a lot of work, though. You're like, okay, we'll do it. So you go to work, you start texting, emailing, calling your coworker. You're like, hey, what do you want to do? What part do you want to take? But you don't hear anything from them. No phone call, no text message, not even a Snapchat from them. You're like, what's up, dude? Come on. Like, where are you at? And so you, you, you just, the, the project's due. It's coming up. So you go to work. You do all the research. You do all the phone calls. You set the appointments. You even do the PowerPoint presentation, and we all know how lame those are. And so you do everything, it gets up to Friday, and you're, it, it's go time. You still haven't heard from your coworker all week, day of, haven't heard from them. But then it's go time, it's noon, and in walks your coworker. And you're like, you turn right around and go out that door. But you come up, and he stands right next to you, and you have to make the presentation. You're like, okay, well, here it is. At the end, the boss, the board, they're all clapping because they're like, yay, you've saved the business. This is awesome. Great job. So he brings you and your coworker into his office, and he says, listen, guys, you did such a good job that I want to give you both a raise. And you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm really thankful, but this guy didn't do anything. Like, he didn't do anything all week. I've done all the work. Man, if anything, I deserve more. I deserve more. And this is how the first workers are feeling. They're like, this isn't fair. We've done all the work, and these guys get the same thing as we do. Have you ever had that moment in life? Have you ever had one of those moments? So why, why is Jesus telling us this story? Why is he sharing, us, sharing with us this story? I don't think that Jesus is trying to give us like a business 101 class. Like, I just can't think that... Some of you business owners, you're like, yeah, Jesus would be a really bad business owner if you operated that way, right? You're not going to give money to people who don't do the work. It just doesn't operate that way. So Jesus isn't telling us how to operate a good Christian business. I think what Jesus is doing is he's trying to show us something profound. I think what he's doing is, is he's, he knows this about us. He knows that we have a tendency to treat God like we treat business, Business is like a merit system. It's like a works-based system. I work for 10 hours a day. I expect to receive 10 hours in pay, right? I pay for something. I expect to receive something back. And we have a tendency to treat God that same way. God, I will give you this in my life if I get something in return from you. And this is universal in religion, all across this world, religion started this way. 
It's about what I do. It's about the effort that I put forth. And then God will accept me. Then God will accept me into heaven. God will accept me into relationship if I do these rituals, meet these things, say the right things, do the right things. Then God will love me. God will accept me. So if I impress God with my behavior, then I expect to receive something back in return because of my behavior. And that's religion. That's works-based religion. And that can creep in to even Christianity, right? There's all sorts of religions that are built on that, but Christianity is built on grace. But even in that truth, it can creep into Christianity, into our lives if we're not careful. And Jesus, what he does in his ministry is he's constantly pushing back on this idea that getting to God is based off of what you do and based off of your good moral behavior. You look at Jesus, you see the conversations that he had with the religious people in his day, and he was constantly challenging that, constantly pushing back on that thought. So if you're like, you're sitting here like me, and you, you go, well, okay, if it's not about the rules, it's not about what you do, then why are they there? Why are the rules even in place? Why did God set up the Old Testament law? Why did God give us commandments? Paul, the apostle, he, he's a church planner, and he was talking to this church because they raised the same question. Well, if it's about grace, then why the rules? Why have we been doing this? And some of you, you're here today, and you're wondering the same thing. You're like, what, why, is the, why is the law there? Look at this in Galatians chapter 3. He says, why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. It was to reveal their imperfection. He says, but the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised, until Jesus came. He's saying that the law, what its intent was, the rules, they're there to meant to frustrate you. To frustrate you so much to get you to see that you cannot achieve perfection on your own. You cannot achieve it to show you actually how imperfect you are so that you wouldn't trust in your perfection, but you would trust in Jesus' perfection. That's why the laws were there. That's why, Je- that's, and, and that's what Jesus is, really what he's doing in this parable. He's trying to help us see that, that it's not about your perfection, but about him. And you know, it's crazy because I've been here, and maybe some of you, you're here today, but what happens when we trust in ourselves? Life gets pretty frustrating, right? Like, it's just a drag to try to follow God when we're trusting in our own performance and our own effort. Some of you, you're here today, and you're like, I'm trying to be a good person. I'm actually here at church today because I just need God to get on my side again. And you're, you're trying to do what's right. You're trying to be holy. You're trying to be good. But what's happening is, is you're making it all about the rules. You're making it all about what you've done and you're frustrated and you're worn out and you're tired and you're saying, man, I can't do this. And Jesus is saying in this parable, he's saying, I'm, I have never expected you and I don't expect you to be like the first worker, to make it about what you do. Actually, what he's saying is, I expect you to have the mindset of the last worker that I don't deserve this, I never deserve this, but yet I get God's grace. That's what he's saying. Don't be like the first worker. Don't have that mindset. You're not the first worker. All of us, we are the last worker. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve God's grace. Maybe you're here today and you're wondering, well, I don't know if I am the first worker. How do I know? Well, let me ask you a couple questions. Do you, in your life, Do you find that the common theme of your life is to be judgmental towards people? That you look at other people and you're constantly critiquing how they live their lives? Constantly saying, oh man, you shouldn't have done that. And there's this pride that comes up within you and you become like a little holier than thou. And you're like, I can't believe you live that way. And you become judgmental of people. You know what I mean? Do you find yourself judging other people? Are you discontent, maybe, with what you have? Look at the first workers. When they go to get paid, they get what they were agreed upon, which was a full day's wage. And then when somebody else, these last workers come in, and they get paid the same thing, all of a sudden, this great thing that they got was no longer good enough for them. They go, man, I, you, I, 
this, I, I, don't, I don't deserve this. I deserve more. How many of us have found ourselves in that? You look at somebody's life. And you, you see God blessing them. You see God going before them. You see the job promotions. You see the friendships that they have. And you go, man, what I have is not good enough. It's this, it's this first worker mentality that I'm discontent with what I have, with what God has given me. Maybe you're like the first worker. Or maybe, maybe you're in life and you're blaming God for, for things that are happening in your life. And you're like, God, I'm doing all of these things. I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying to go to church. I'm trying not to, I'm trying not to cuss. I'm trying not to you know, drink and smoke and all these things. God, what's, what's going on here? Like, don't I deserve more? And you begin to blame God because he's not coming through for you. Maybe you have the mindset of the first worker. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't have that first worker mindset. Have the last worker mindset. I can't tell you enough, but man, that's good news for us. That's good news for you and for me because now it's not about our perfection, but it's on his perfection. And when we realize that, man, the lift that comes up, the encouragement that happens, the, the hope that happens in our lives. Jesus says, be like the last worker. So let's look at these guys. These guys, they're hired not because they've done anything to deserve it, right? Historically, if you, look at, if you look at these guys who were left, these would have been the weakest of all the workers. They would have been the people that nobody else wanted to hire. You know, the, the, the standing around in the marketplace, and then in comes the foreman on the back of a camel, right? That's what they do. I don't know how. I've never ridden a camel. My dad once did, oh man, and he went to Israel, and he was, anyways, he, it was this awkward thing, the camel fell over, he fell over, but, <laughs> so, foreman comes in, he's on the back of a camel, and he goes, hey, I need a carpenter, because that's obviously how they talked, and the carpenter, the strongest guy, he comes up, and he's like pushing his way through the crowd, and so the foreman chooses him, and then he comes back in, the foreman says, I need an electrician, and the fastest guy comes in, and he pushes past the crowd, jumps on the back of the camel, and he's like, ha <laughs> losers, too bad for you. Comes back in, he says, hey, I need a plumber. And then the biggest guy is standing there, and the foreman looks across, and he goes, I want you to come work for me. Now, who was left? You had the slowest, you had the weakest, you had the smallest of all the people and in walks this generous landowner, and he says, this is the group of people that I want. This is the people who I want to come work for me. Can you imagine how they were feeling in that moment? They were probably saying, wait, well, wait a second, you must, you must not know us. I'm not good enough to work for you. And he's like, no, 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 come on. Yeah, you are. You're good enough. Come work for me. Yeah, but, but you don't know about my sketchy past. You don't know the things that I've done. And the generous landowner looks at him and says, I don't care. Come on, come work for me. Yeah, but I don't, I don't bring anything to the table. I don't have any talents to give you. And, and, and the landowner is like, no, come work for me. He's kind. He's gracious. He's generous. He sees past their imperfections, and he invites them to come work for him in his vineyard. It's interesting because these, these last workers, they don't try to negotiate a deal with the landowner, do they? They don't say, okay, well, we're going to only work for an hour. Let's sign here and you give me this. No, they, they simply trust him. The Bible says that they trust that he would do what was fair. And they go, they work for an hour in the coolest time of the day. It's the easiest time to work. And then payment time comes. They give them their checks and they look down and they don't get paid what they deserve, but they get paid what they don't deserve. And they go, oh my goodness, what? I don't deserve this. I didn't do the work. But yet I get a full day's wage and this overwhelming sense of awe and deep appreciation and humility comes over these guys. And they're like, I didn't deserve this, yet I get all of this, and Jesus is telling you and he's telling me, have that kind of mindset when you approach God. God, I don't deserve this, yet I get all of this. I get salvation. I get eternal life. I get to work with you. I get to be called your son, your daughter. And it's not based off of what you've done, but it's based off of what he's done. And that is amazing. You don't bring anything to the table, but yet God invites you. 
You don't deserve his goodness, yet you get God's goodness. You don't deserve his kindness. I don't deserve his kindness, yet we get to receive it. That's what grace is. It's not about what we've done, but what's been done for us. And man, do you think that this cost the landowner something? Did it cost him something? I, I, I believe that it did. To pay them a full day's wage for an hour's work, you bet it did. He had to sacrifice to show these guys his goodness. And Jesus, he knows this as he's telling us this story. He knows that just in a few days, later on in his life, he would go to a cross and he would sacrifice his life to show us his goodness. It cost him everything. Jesus is saying, I am the good, generous landowner. I'm the landowner who's been kind to you, who's been generous to you. And man, the early church, this shaped and transformed the way that they thought, the way that they talked. It changed everything about them. They started churches. They were in life groups meeting, talking about God's grace and his mercy and his goodness in their life. They didn't get around and talk about, let's talk about how we can be just better people. How do I be a good moral person? How, what self-help books can I read more often to just make sure that I'm doing things right? They got together and they talked about the grace of God. Look at this. Paul in, in Ephesians, he writes this to the church. He says, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. He says, by nature, because we were born into this world as sinners, we were separated from God. And we deserved God's wrath and his punishment for us. But look at this. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. And he says, it's by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It was freely given to you, not by works so that no one can boast. It's not about what you do. It's not about your works. It's not about what you can accomplish, but it's by grace you have been saved. And this is what changed them. This is what motivated them to be people of God, to love and follow God and to live for him. It, this idea of grace and not works, it changed how they talked. It changed how they thought. It changed how they parented. It changed how they worked. It changed how they worshiped. It changed everything. And man, I don't know about you, but God's grace has radically changed my life. Some of you, you're here today, you're like, man, I'm a testament of that. When I found God's grace, man, I found life. I found meaning. I found hope. A new world was open to me. Man, I don't know about you, but I've, I've experienced that in my life, and I'm so thankful because I used to be a person who is all about performance, all about what I did, and those things still come in, right, throughout our journey, this thought, this first worker mindset, but when grace gets a hold of your heart, man, it changes everything. And here's a few things that I feel like grace helps us with. I think grace, it helps us love people. I think it helps you love people. You know, as you, all of us know people in our lives who are like hard to deal with. Maybe you're a coworker with this person. Maybe you live in the same house with this person. But they're hard to deal with. They're hard to love. They're hard to show kindness to. And as you interact with them, it's just like a struggle. But man, when you are changed by grace, you realize and you understand something. God, I didn't deserve your kindness. I didn't deserve your love. But yet you still give it to me. And God says, that's the same way I want you to treat people. Your coworker, your neighbor, your friend, your family member, whoever it is. Man, I just challenge you. Think about who is that person that you need to show God's grace to. God has been faithful to you. Even despite your perfection, he can give you the power to show love and kindness to people despite their perfections. Grace, it helps us love people. Grace, it helps us overcome sin. Look at this powerful, powerful scripture. Romans chapter six and verse 14 says, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. Some of you, you're here today and you're struggling with sin. You're addicted to sin. Maybe you've got things in your life and you know, man, I am not, I am not strong here. And you've been attempting to get over sin 
by just applying more rules to your life. And you're, you're, you're trying to do more programs, you're trying to read more books, none of those things are bad, but when you make it only about those things, your eyes get off of the one and the only one who overcame sin, the only one who can give you the power that you actually need to overcome sin. Jesus, when he died on that cross, he conquered sin for you. He conquered death for you, hell, the grave. So Jesus is saying, don't look at yourself. Don't look at other people. Don't let that be the basis and the motivation to not sin. Look to me, the only one who overcame sin. Sin is no longer a master over you, not because of the rules, but because of God's grace. Some of you, you're here today and you needed to hear that. And you need to know that there is power and there is hope for you that you don't have to be addicted anymore. God's grace is so good. And when you get a hold of that, it gives you the power to say, no, I don't want that. I want you, God. And there's power that comes from that. Third, grace gives you confidence. Romans 8.1, one of my favorite passages of scripture, it says, there is therefore no, now no condemnation. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Some of you, you're walking around, your head's hanging low. There's shame, there's guilt, there's frustration, and you're walking into church and you're going, God, I don't deserve to be here. God, look what I've done. Look at my past. And God is saying you can boldly approach the throne of grace. You don't have to come to God with condemnation. You can come to God with confidence because it's not about you anymore. It's about him. You can boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence. God says, I want to lift you up. I want to lift you up. Jesus says that my burden is light. My yoke is easy. This thing called religion, this thing called relationship with God does not have to be hard for you. It's not intended to be that way. It's about you just fully leaning into God's grace and saying, God, I can't do this life on my own. I got to have you. And when you do that, there is a freedom there. There is a lift there because it's not about you anymore. And God gives you confidence because of it. His grace gives you confidence. You can walk through this life knowing that you never earn God's grace, meaning you cannot lose God's grace. You are God's. He is yours. You are his son. You are his daughter. And when you realize that and you're overwhelmed by that, man, there is a confidence that comes in you. Your head is lifted high and you say, God, I don't deserve to be here, but you are awesome. And I'm so thankful that, God, you invited me in. It's all about grace. Amen. Amen. Our idea of fairness is way off. What's better than you getting what's fair? It's grace. Walk in grace today. Amen. Let's pray.